Good Friday. If you want to take out communion, and for those watching online, you could find some things around your home for communion. And for those that are watching later, just uh, find something that you could use for communion. And we're going to start, today we're going to take a moment and reflect on the various stages that Jesus went through. And of course, yesterday was Monday, Thursday, that's where Jesus was with his disciples for his last supper. It's also where Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. So today we're going to start there and we're going to open with communion. And uh, we have communion available at, at the, as you walk through the door at the entry point of the sanctuary. As you're getting ready for communion... I just want us to reflect on the fact that at this table, at this supper, you know, kind of reflect on your own life. A lot of times, you know, dinner, dinner times with family can be very festive. Dinner times with family can be exciting and fun. And, but at times, maybe, maybe there's times in your life where the dinner table had some drama. Maybe the dinner table wasn't filled with festivities and laughter, but maybe there was some serious conversations that took place. Maybe there was some things that happened there that, you know, needed to be discussed. But during the Last Supper, you can see that that's what happened. If, you know, during the Last Supper, a competition was breaking out at the dinner table of who was the best disciple. But I love what Jesus did. In the midst of the disciples arguing of who was the greatest, guess what Jesus did? He wrapped a towel around his waist and got up from the table and started washing feet. As an example of, look, the first will be last, and the last will be first. He started washing feet. And Peter asked Christ, says, Lord, I, why are you washing me? And, and he says, unless if I wash you, you'll have no part with me. So Jesus was washing feet. And then at the same, in the same gesture, what happened? Judas decided to get up from the table and he was going to sell Jesus out and betray him. And even Jesus dipped the bread and offered it to Judas and Judas refused to take it. And Jesus says, whatever you've got to do, do it quickly. And then in the midst of that dinner, Judas gets up and leaves and all the disciples are questioning, like, what's going on here? So you see that... <laughs> During the Last Supper, there was some things that was taking place. And, and then even during that dinner time, Peter would, would tell Jesus he would not deny him. And, and Jesus said to Peter, Peter, Simon Peter, not only will you deny me, but when you hear the rooster crow three times, it will be a reminder that you have. But don't worry, Peter. I, I pray. I pray for you that your faith would not fail you. And when you return back to me, I need you to go back and strengthen your brothers. A lot happened around the Last Supper. It was also the beginning stages of what Jesus was going to do for us. Because we know that the Last Supper represents the Passover meal. The Passover represented what God did in the Exodus, where, where the blood on the doorposts would be the protection of God's people. And, you had seen the great, then the next day the great exodus of God's people from, from Egypt into the promised land. That's why we celebrate the Passover. That's why we celebrate Holy Week. It's a, it, for us, it's a moment to reflect and to remember. But for us as believers, it's also a time of joy and great anticipation because we know that Jesus will be coming back for each and every one of us. And today with joy, we get to celebrate and kind of walk through and reflect on our own lives on these different stages. And, and so as we jump into the, to the afternoon, just take out the, the communion elements. And, you know, at the supper, Jesus took out the bread and he, and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus is the bread of life. He is the manna that fell from heaven. He he is our provision, and we're going to see that his broken body is what allows us to be healed. He took the bread, he broke it, he says, take and eat. Do this in remembrance of me. So let's eat together. During, the, during that time, he picked up a cup, and he says, this is the cup of a new covenant. This is the cup of my blood. 
And we know that at this time, the disciples really, Jesus was trying to give them foreshadowing of what he was going to do and why, but we know that it wasn't until Jesus was glorified that the disciples really understood what Jesus did for them. But he picked up the cup. And he says, this is the cup of the new covenant. We know that this is the cup. This is the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus is what sets us free today. We know that the blood of Jesus protects us. That the blood protects us on the outside and the inside. We know that Leviticus says there's life in the blood. And then as we drink this cup today, it's a reminder that, that Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice for you and I. And the Passover is a Jesus fulfilled everything leading up to the Passover as a reminder that he was the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world. We also take this cup knowing that one day we're going to be in heaven and Jesus said with his disciples, this will be the last time on earth I'll drink this cup, but the next time we drink it will be in eternity. It will be at the wedding supper of the Lamb. And as believers in Jesus Christ, that's something we can look forward to. That's something that, that when Christ comes, comes back, and whether through death or through rapture, we'll be taken up with him in heaven and we'll all will be ushered into that wedding supper. Where we all will be sitting at a table sharing testimonies and stories of what Jesus had done. And that's a great day for us to anticipate it, especially during dark times and times of trial and tribulation. The communion for us is, a, is an example that we have something to look forward to. And the early church did that. They, they came together frequently and had communion because during times of persecution, communion was a way that they would remember what Jesus has done, but at the same time look forward to what they can anticipate in heaven. So let's drink together today in celebration and anticipation of what Christ is going to do for us in the future. So we started at the upper room and now we're going to worship our way from the upper room into the garden. As we're preparing to enter into the garden, take some time to examine. Take some time to see have there been areas in your life where you've denied Christ. Maybe there was a moment when you felt like, like Judas, you wanted to turn your back on him because life is hard and difficult and Whatever you were facing, maybe like Judas, you were tempted to, to turn your back on Jesus or be like Peter where you denied him. Or maybe like the, maybe you're one of the disciples around the table. Maybe you think you're, you're bigger than life and you think you deserve this or that. Like the disciples, I'm the greatest, I'm the best. Well, before we, as we leave the upper room into the garden, take some time during this worship time to reflect. And that's what this afternoon is. You know, we're not going to have any lyrics on the screen. However, feel free to worship to the songs that, are, that you're familiar with. Um, engage with that, how the Lord wants. But I, the, the purpose of this afternoon is to reflect, to remember, to let, to let God sing over you. But at the same time, take some time to really reflect on your own walk with the Lord and put yourself in the story. Put yourself in the upper room. Put yourself in the garden. Put yourself as part of the crowd of the courtyard. Put yourself at the crowd of the crucifixion. Put yourself at the tomb where we're going to end today. And just see if the Holy Spirit wants to speak some things to your heart as we take this worshipful journey from the upper room to the tomb today. So Father, as we get ready to enter into the garden, I pray that you speak to our hearts today. May we reflect May we remember, may we rejoice. But Lord, even as we walk through these things, Father, we're asking you to do a work on our, on our heart today. Father, are there areas in our lives that as we walk through these movements, Lord, are there, are there, are there things that you want to do in us? Are there things you want to change in us? Are there areas about you that you want us to understand deeper today? Are there little truths or nuggets along the journey that maybe we've never noticed before? But today, Lord, may your Holy Spirit speak to us as we journey from the upper room to the garden, to the courtyard, to the cross, to the tomb. Speak to our hearts today and 
and allow us to learn, to grow, to dive deeper in a greater understanding of what you did for us. And so, Father, we just give you place today as we worship you, as we honor you, and as we remember. In Jesus' name, amen.
chapter 23, verse 39, it said, Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw behind them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. And I love this. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. And when he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, asleep exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. As we look at the garden, the garden is a place where Jesus surrendered to his will so that he could accept his Father's will. And that's important. Because Jesus, he was in a place where he just wanted to quit. He was in a place where he wanted to give up. And he, and I love what it says at the beginning of this text. It says, as usual, he went to the Mount of Olives. So we know that this wasn't the first time that Jesus went. But he was here at this place of prayer that he would frequent often. And he knew what was facing him. He knew that he was getting ready to lay down his life. And I love that because we see that the blood started to drop in the garden. The blood didn't start in the courtyard. The blood didn't start on the cross. The, the blood started in the garden. The first drop of blood that Jesus spilled for us happened while he was praying to his father and he was looking at the cup that his father gave him and even for a moment it was almost like Jesus was doubting or wondering should I really do this should I really take this cup should I really should I really do it but but it was a quick second he says no not my will but your will be done I don't know where you're at today I don't know if you're at a place of of quitting, wanting to give up, wanting to, to, to die, or I'm not sure where you're at, but I look at it this way. Today is it, the garden is where it's like where things it's where things grow, but also things die and get things get pulled away. It's the garden is a place where the gardener comes and takes out the trimming shears and cuts away some things. Not, not because not because he wants to, but because he sees the destiny that you carry. He sees the fruit. He sees the fruit in your life that you don't see yet. So he realizes, you know what? I'm going to take out some hedge clippers. I got to remove some things because the Father always sees your destiny. He always sees ahead of what you can produce in his kingdom. And in order to get the great fruit, in order to get the abundance that he sees, he has to trim away some things. So the garden is a place of pruning. It's a, it's a place of surrender, but it's a place where in order for God to do what he really wants to do, we have to go to the garden first. It's a place where God begins to see the fruit and the destiny of your life and says, you know what? Let me, let me remove some of the leaves. Let me remove some of the things. And, and also think about it with Adam and Eve. The garden is a place where God removed the fig leaves, the fear, the insecurity, and the guilt, fig leaf, loneliness, escapism, anxiety, and failure, and fear. It's like in the garden is where the fig leaves get pulled off of our lives. In the garden is where the first sacrifice was made because in Adam and Eve's sin, God get an animal and, and put animal skins on them as a sign of redemption and cleansing. So the garden, it's a place where redemption begins. It's a place where deliverance comes. It's a place where God removes some things from our lives so the greater fruit can come in the future. And it's where we surrender to our will and take his will. 
But also, the garden is the place where Jesus got strength. The blood started to drop, but yet the Bible says that an angel came to give him strength. Why? So that he could endure what we're gonna, where we're gonna go to next. We're gonna go to the courtyard. Then we're gonna go to the cross. Two of the places where Jesus suffered the most horrible suffering we could ever go through, but what prepared him to handle the courtyard, what prepared him to handle the cross was the garden. God gave him the strength to face the persecution ahead of him. Come on, somebody, as a church right now, I believe today we need to lean into something deeper here, that, that what we're going through is preparation for the future. The garden is where Jesus got strength to endure persecution. He got strength to stand before Pilate. He got the strength to carry the cross. He got the strength to, to, to be mocked and spit at. He got the strength to where he could utter seven final words on the cross before he breathed his last. It's, the garden is a place where, where he was prepared to handle the trials of the future. And I believe today that's something that we need to lean into as Christians and as believers. None of us know what lies around the corner in the future, but God does. But as we take time to reflect on the garden, what are the areas that we need? Where, where are the areas of our lives that we haven't completely 100% surrendered? This is our moment to surrender. This is our moment also to accept strength. You know, maybe you're in something and you've lost the hope. Maybe you've lost some strength. But guess what? The garden is a place where you can get strength. God sent an angel. At one of Jesus' weakest moments, there was an angel that came to attend to him and to give him the strength that he needed to fulfill the purpose, to fulfill the plan that God has. And that gives all of us hope that, 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 that God's will does not require your strength. It requires strength of heaven coming on you so that you have the strength to move ahead. And that's good news, that when we accept the will of the Father, He also provides everything we need to fulfill the will of the Father, no matter how difficult it looks today. So, Father, as we take time to sit in the garden, we know that our flesh is weak today, but our spirit is willing. Father, may, may you reveal to us the areas of surrender today, Father, show me, and Lord, even as a pastor, show me where, where I need strength, where I need heavenly strength today. Father, show me where the areas of my life where I need 100, do this 100% surrender. Father, my spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. Father, just reveal to me those areas. And Father, Lord, today I also embrace the, the suffering. I, I embrace the, the trimming shears because you see fruit in my life that I don't see yet. And so, Lord, I, I surrender and I surrender to your hands, God. I, I accept your will for my life, knowing that you got to do what you got to do to get more fruit out of me. Father, I can't produce fruit, but I know you can produce fruit through me. So, Father, just bring the, the trimming shears today. Trim some things away so more fruit can come. And Lord, all of us, I believe in this season, we need more strength. So Father, just give us the strength. Lord, you sent an angel to attend to Jesus' weaknesses. You, you sent an angel to attend to him, to give him the nourishment and the strength that he needed to endure the courtyard and, and the cross. And so Father, send us supernatural help today. Send us supernatural strength. Because, Father, when we surrender to your will, you provide the strength to accomplish it. So, Father, as we surrender, Father, release the provision we need, the strength we need, the healing we need, the deliverance we need, the hope that we need, the promises that we need. Send everything that we need so that we can step forward into the calling that you have for each of us today. Father, remove those fig leaves from our, from our lives. And may we embrace the salvation. May we embrace the redemption that you have given us. And Father, thank you that in that garden, blood was spilled. Thank you that you prayed to the point to where your blood can be poured out to, to cleanse us to wash us, 
Thank you for your blood that protects us. Thank you for your blood that redeems us today. In Jesus' name.
sense right now as we're leaving the garden, I just still pray, Lord, whether it's for someone that's online or now or later here, Father, release that help. Father, release help. Father, your word says your, our spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak. Father, I just pray for those that feel weak right now, that feel like there's no strength left. But Father, I pray, send, send help. Father, send, send provision. Father, set a promise in the name of Jesus. Even right now, Lord, Lord may your voice just speak a word that, that would just be timely for them. Even right now, Lord, remind them of a promise, a prophetic word. Remind them of, of a scripture. Father, those that feel like, man, their, their flesh is weak, God, just release strength. Father, just release that heavenly strength, Father. Just like... Just like you sent an angel to Jesus, God, just release that supernatural help right now. Father, release that supernatural aid in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just release it right now. Father, just release that help. And God, release that strength in the name of Jesus. Father, you are willing. That's what I love about you. You're so, you're so willing. Father, anyone who reached out to you, you, you were willing to touch them. You were willing to heal them. You were willing to deliver them. You were willing to, to meet a need. So, Father, you're willing today. And, Father, I just ask that that lie that might be penetrating someone's mind that says, you're not willing. Lord, we know that's a lie because your word says you are willing. And anyone who comes to you and asks, you answer, and you bless, and you encourage, and you strengthen so, Father, those that, that feel like they need that today, God, just bring your help because you're willing. And just, just, just come to them. God, may they feel your tangible presence hugging them, loving them, encouraging them right now. So, Father, just touch that person today. May they know that you're willing today. That you're willing. <laughs> we just thank you for that today. In Jesus' name. I just felt that. I just felt the weight on that. As we leave the garden now, Jesus is arrested. You know, he, he goes before the Sanhedrin court and he gets judged by the Pharisees. So the beating, the beating starts there. You know, he just doesn't get ushered into the, the court of the Sanhedrin. You know, he that's where that's where the hitting starts. That's where that's where it begins. And, 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 and then this is the time, this is the time frame where, where Peter denies Christ because as Peter, as Peter follows and John, they, they're following Jesus as he's getting arrested. And, and as he's in getting judged by the Pharisees, he's getting beaten there. And the beating starts. And, and in my sermon, when we talked about when the rooster crows, it's just, just as Jesus walks out of the door. The rooster crows, and, and, and the crowing of the rooster is also a time to, a, attributed to temple worship beginning in the temple, where the temple crier shouts out a call to worship, a call to sacrifice. It's at that time of worship, Jesus walks out of the door, and, and Peter hears that. And it's like, a, it's like and the Bible says Jesus and Peter, they lock, they lock eyes, but it's almost like this is what Jesus is saying to Peter. Peter, I'm the sacrifice that's being prepared. I'm the sacrifice that's being prepared for you. As Peter denied Christ, Jesus comes out to remind Peter of the promise and of that look. I'm today, as, as, as the temple crier is calling out for the sacrifice and the worship, it's at that time Jesus says to Peter, I'm the one that's being sacrificed today. I'm being sacrificed for you, Peter. Remember my word. I pray that your faith would not fail you, Peter. It's like in that moment, Jesus was ministering to Peter. And then as Jesus is being arrested, he's brought over to Pilate. So Jesus, so Jesus already getting bruised up and beaten from the, from the Pharisees because they thought he was a false prophet. And when he claimed that he was the Messiah, the Pharisees didn't like that. So they hand him over to Pilate to be judged and Pilate realizes man this is an innocent man and I love it and even not only interesting Pilate's wife gets a dream and says to her husband don't judge this man so even Pilate's wife was trying to 
to remind her husband, look, I, this is an innocent man here. And, and even Pilate is trying to have a conversation with Jesus. And even Pilate comes up with a creative idea. How about I get this really bad dude called Barabbas? How about I bring him out and, and put him next to Jesus? And, and just maybe the crowd will pick this guy. This guy is, a, is beat. This guy is a loser. This guy has committed horrible crimes. And, and the crowd should be, it should be obvious on who should be sentenced to be crucified. Not this man who's innocent, but how about this guy Barabbas? So Pilate, Pilate had this great idea, but we saw the idea backfired. The crowd would rather have Barabbas released than Jesus. And then it gets picked up in Matthew chapter 27, verse 27. The governor, the governors, it says here, Pilate released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him. Now, granted, remember, he just has been horribly beaten, by the way. All right? This, they, they stripped him of his clothing after the fact that he's been flogged. And if you saw the passion of the Christ, you got to get an idea of what he looked like in this scene. So they stripped him. And they put a scarlet robe. So let's picture that. You, he's already bleeding out, has all these sores on his body. Now they're trying to put, now they're ripping. Just think of the, think of the, of the sores and the blood already drying up. And then you rip that clothing off of him. And now you're putting more clothing on him. That's, that's more pain. And then they twisted together a crown of thorns. And they set it on his head. And then they put a staff in his hand. And they knelt in front of him and they mocked him. Hail the king of the Jews, they said. And they spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. After they had mocked him, they took off the robe. Again, the peeling away, that must be painful. And put on his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to be crucified. But we need to also go to Isaiah to get another understanding of what happened here. It says, he had no beauty or majesty. This is Isaiah 53, verse 2. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not, and surely he took up our infirmities, carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us our own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her, shears is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people, he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor there was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him, cause him to suffer, and through the Lord makes his life a guilt offering. He will see his offspring in prolonged days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As we look at the courtyard and look at what Jesus faced, blood is pouring out now. Drops of blood in the garden. Now, the, now he's really been opened up, and the blood is redemption is, is already being released. And I love that promise in Isaiah. 
that by his stripes we are healed. Jesus' body was broken today so that our bodies could be healed. Even in this time, even as we go to the courtyard, the atonement, the atoning sacrifice of Jesus brings physical healing to all of our hearts and our lives. I want to remind you of the seven places where Jesus bled. In the seven places where Jesus bled, you could grab that today for you because seven is the number of completion, which means the seven places where Jesus bled on his body gives us hope and assurance that we can be complete, we can be made whole, we can be set free today because his blood sets us free. Let me remind you that his beard was plucked for, you know, the beard that plucked, they had plucked Jesus' beard and the blood that spilled up from them pulling down on his beard. Guess what? God heals your shame today. Do you feel shame or guilt or condemnation today? Because Jesus' beard is plucked. You could get deliverance from that today. Then we see that his head, we saw the crown of thorns that, that was placed on his head and they took a stick and they pounded it down like a nail. That, guess what? His head was wounded so your head could be healed today. You got head trauma, you got head injuries, you, you got things that you're dealing with in the head. Maybe you got torment, maybe you got bad thoughts hitting you. I got good news for you today. Jesus' head was bled for you so that your head could be healed today. And we know that that the battlefield starts in the mind. That Jesus Jesus took the pain and the suffering of his head so all of our heads could be healed today, so that we could be set free from torment. We could be set free from depression. We could be set free from all these mental things that are coming attack. Mental illness could be healed today in Jesus' name. That anything, that anything that happened to our heads could be healed today. We also know that he, his hands bled. They, they punctured his hands. And he wants to restore your authority today. His hands bled so that authority can be brought back to the church, to his people. We see that his feet bled. When they nailed his feet, it's a, it's a reminder that God is healing your calling. God is healing your path today. That he wants to He wants to set your feet. Like how beautiful are the feet of those that bring good news today. His, his feet were punctured so that it's made possible for you to fulfill the call of God on your life today. The Bible says that he was bruised. He took the internal pain of your heart and life today. He, anything that's happened to you internally. The bruising on the outside, but also the bruising of a soul, the bruising of a heart. Jesus heals your heart today. He took the, the bruising and the pain so that you could be healed today, so that you could be set free from, from internal pain and inequities today. He wants to remove your bondage today. The areas of your life where you feel bruised, maybe it's personal, maybe maybe it's relationships between family members and friends today. Maybe there's some bruise in there. Guess what? Jesus wants to heal that today. He wants to set you free. The sword that was punctured in his side when he bled there is a reminder that he forgives us of our sin. He was pierced. His body was pierced so that he could be forgiven. And we also see that he sweat blood also from his head. The sweating of blood reminds us that he wants to heal your anxiety. He wants to take away your stress. He wants to take away your sorrow, your griefs, and your, and, and your fear today. Jesus bled in these seven places today, not, not, to hear you, not to heal you partially, but wholly. He wants to make you whole and complete today. And when Jesus was ushered into the courtyard, he did all of that so you and I, not, not so that we could be forgiven just of our sin, so that we could be healed on the inside, on the outside, so that we could be made whole from the top of our head to the soles of our feet. Jesus bled in all these places today so that all of us could grab the healing that, that's due us, that we could grab that in faith today, that God could make us whole and complete so, Father, I pray right now, as we reflect on the courtyard, your word says that you're the Lord God that heals us today. Your word says that by your stripes we are healed. And, Father, we receive the healing. We receive the healing that you gave us. Father, you bled in seven areas of your body. 
Father, we're asking today that you make us whole, that you make us complete. Father, in faith, we grab what your word says about healing today. We thank you that you bled for us. We thank you, God, that you, through your atonement, you bring healing to our physical bodies. And Father, I pray healing to be released today for those watching online or later, for those that are here. Father, release healing in the name of Jesus. Father, bring healing from the top of their head to the soles of their feet today. Father, remove pain, remove swelling. God, remove bruising, remove the internal pain and suffering people are carrying, whether it's in the mind, the heart, the soul, the, the organs of their body. The, the organs of their body aren't visible to the world, but yet they're internal. So, Father, you were bruised so those organs could be healed today. Stomachs, intestines, hearts, and livers, and pancreases, those things were bruised so that they could be healed. So, Father, we're asking that you bring healing to those areas. Areas. Father, bring healing to the heart today. God, those that have heart conditions and heart issues, bring healing to the heart today. Take out the old and stick in a new one. Father, those that are dealing with mental illness, those that are dealing with, with, with torment of the mind, God, you were, your head was wounded so heads can be healed today. Father, release healing to the mind. God, release healing to the thoughts today in the name of Jesus. Father, restore authority back to your church as, as, you, were, as you were wounded in the hands, God. You, you want to bless the work of our hands. And, and so, Father, I pray that, that, that you restore identity, that you restore purpose back to your church. God, restore, restore callings. Restore callings back to the church today as the fever pumps your God. Those that, that maybe walked away from the call of God, those that have walked away from purpose or destiny, Father, your feet were wounded so that people's calling and that people's identity can be restored, so people's path can be restored, Father. God, restore, begin to restore the steps back to your people so they can step into the fullness of calling and destiny today. Father, just, God, as we worship you right now, as we enter into this time of worship, God, just release healing to those that need healing. God, your word says that you're the son of righteousness that rises up with healing and explains, God, rise up over your church today. Rise up over your children and release Healing, God, release the glory of God over them to bring healing from the top of their head to the soles of their feet. Even as, even in our worship, God, even in our de declaration of praise and, and declaring truth, God, your presence can come, your presence can heal. So, Father, we thank you for that. And we reflect on this courtyard. We thank you, God, that the courtyard, it was a horrible place, but we thank, are thankful for the courtyard because without the courtyard, we don't get healing. And we thank you that you walked through the courtyard so that you could bring healing to your kids. You're a good, good father. You, you took the punishment. You took the sin, but you also took the sickness. You took the disease. You're a good father. You took all of that for us today. And there's no one, none of us have, the, have, have enough money to pay back what you did. It's impossible. But you took it on our behalf and we receive it today. We are so thankful that you, that you bled so that we could be healed. That you were wounded so that we could be healed today. And so, Father, we are so thankful. And we are so thankful. And so, Father, as we enter into this little time of worship, that I just ask God that you and your presence would come and touch those that need healing today. Those that are watching, those that are watching later, those that are here in the sanctuary, God, may they just feel your presence come to them right now. Touch them and heal them and restore them. Father, we ask for total, whole and complete healing to be released today. In Jesus' name, amen. Stories that improved your faithfulness. I've seen miracles my mind can't comprehend. There is beauty in what I can understand. Jesus, it's you.
it says in Luke's gospel that two men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals. One on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. And they said, He saved others, let him save himself, of he's the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also came and offered him some wine vinegar to drink and, and said, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above that read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him and said, Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and save us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said. Since you're under the same sentence, we are punished justly. For what we're getting, what our deeds, what our de deeds deserve. But the man next to us has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. What a beautiful picture of salvation. Jesus fulfilled what he said he would do. He said that he would die, that take away the sins of the world. And John the Baptist at the beginning of his ministry said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And Jesus fulfilled the will of the Father. And we know that he's going to fulfill more of it later, but he came to take our sin. He came so that all of us could have forgiveness. And, and the final person that Jesus reached before he breathed this last was this criminal. This man here deserved nothing. And I, I just put it this way. What's the testimony of this criminal when he gets to heaven? Like, just picture it this way. The criminal dies and he gets ready to go into heaven. And the angel says, what, what, what right do you have to enter into heaven? And, and the only thing the man can say is, well, the man on the, the, man on the middle cross said I could come. And guess what? That gives everybody hope in the room today. That the, the man on the middle cross said, I can come. That's an invitation for everyone. That's an invitation for your co-workers, family members, and friends today. If you know people that need Jesus, that the criminal on the cross is such a great, perfect picture. Because it always reminds us there's still time. Time is still left. And, 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 and guess what? No one's left behind. Jesus leaves no one left behind today. And it's never too late to say yes to Jesus. Maybe you're watching online today. Maybe you're watching later here and you're thinking, you know what, maybe, maybe it's too late. No, it's never too late. It wasn't too late for that criminal. He, up, to, up to that point, that criminal did nothing. But in the final moments of his life, he stood up for Jesus. He defended Jesus. And guess what? We all have to ask. He asked him, hey, Jesus, will you remember me today? Jesus said, yes, you remember me. And the only way that this man gets access into the kingdom is because the man in the middle said, come on in. <laughs> the man on the middle cross said, I can come. I love that. Gives all of us hope today. And then a practical application for all of us is as we get ready to, to, to end this at the tomb here in a moment. Just, I just want you to think of this. Jesus Jesus, in his pain, said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. You know, I've been in ministry a long time, and a lot of people struggle with forgiveness. And they say, when do I, when do I forgive those that have hurt me? He says, well, Jesus gave us the ultimate model. He said, in the middle of the pain. I said, Jesus, in, this, in the middle of the most horrible pain anyone would suffer, he said, Father, forgive them. It was even a miracle that he didn't speak that because of all the blood and the trauma that his body already endured. It was a miracle that he was even to utter that prayer, but he did as a model for us that when we're in pain, when we're, when we're um, in the middle of an offense or when we're in the middle of an argument, when we're in the middle of somebody that's burned us and done us wrong, we say, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. And I said, we forgive right away. 
77 times 7, Jesus said, we, we keep forgiving. Yet some people need more forgiveness than others, but forgiveness, who do you need to forgive today? I mean, Jesus modeled it for all of us that, that he doesn't want us. Even Jesus didn't hold on to the pain. He didn't hold on to the offense. He didn't hold on to the bitterness. He, he didn't hold it over the heads of those that crucified him and hurt him. And I mean, I mean, if anyone had a right to be offended, it was Jesus, but he didn't. He said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. He didn't wait till after he was resurrected to come back and offer forgiveness. He offered forgiveness in the pain, and that's a model for us, that, that forgiveness is what starts the healing. Forgiveness is what starts reconciliation. Forgiveness is a part of the healing puzzle. And, I've seen it so many times. A lot of times people struggle with physical healing, but when they when they when I lead them into a prayer of forgiveness, it's amazing how the physical healing comes instantly. Because it wasn't the fact that they were physically inhibited, it was that, that they forgot to forgive. And that forgiveness is what really brought the sickness in the first place. So when they forgive the person that hurt them, the physical healing comes. For some people, that's that's breakthrough for them. Is they hold on to that bitterness, they hold on to that offense, but when they finally release that offense in the person, it's amazing how the how the transformation and the breakthrough and the physical healing comes. And maybe as we go into this next song, this chorus, that maybe there's somebody today that you need to forgive. Maybe there's a relationship that needs reconciliation. Maybe you just need to come to Jesus today and you're saying, Jesus, I've never accepted you into my heart. And you know, maybe some of you are like the criminal, like. You know, it's never too late to come back to Jesus today. Maybe you've drifted from the Lord. Come back to him today. I, I, you know, all you can say is, dear Jesus, come into my heart, save me. Just, just pray the criminal's prayer on the cross. Jesus, will you remember me today? I'm coming to you. And I, you, it's like the criminal's prayer is this, is I deserve, I deserve this judgment, but you don't but you took my judgment upon you and I believe that and I'm thankful for that. That's the criminal's prayer. It's the criminal realized that, wait, this, this, this man is just and he doesn't deserve to be here. I deserve to be here. He doesn't, but Jesus takes all of that onto him today. He takes your pain on him today. He takes your sorrow on him today. He takes everything so that you can be free so that you can have a place and a home in heaven today. So, Father, I pray that as we focus on the cross, we're so thankful that you, God, that you saved us, that you redeemed us. That, Father, salvation doesn't come from our works. It doesn't come from the, the good things that we do. No, it comes only from you. We know that all of us today, as we look at you on the cross, we... We know that we deserve judgment. We, we deserve to be there, but thank you that you that you were the substitute for our sin. That you hung, that you bled, that you died for us. So that the criminal on the cross, we all have a home in heaven. We all have a place there. And, and because of the man on the middle said we could come, that's the only way we could have it. You gave us all an invitation to come. And today... We receive that. Lord, I pray for those that have drifted to come back home today. I pray for those today that need, Lord, really strength for people to forgive today. Father, we, we, Lord, we just forgive those that have hurt us. We forgive those that we're mad at. We forgive those that, 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 have, that have done us wrong today. Father, thank you for modeling forgiveness. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. Father, may we pray that prayer as often as we need. And Father, we just are so thankful that the, that the climax of salvation happened at the, at the foot of the cross today. Father, we thank you that you're still saving, that you're still delivering, that you're still redeeming. Father, we lift up our city. We lift up our loved ones that don't know you today. And Father, we bring them to the cross. We, we bring our family, our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers. God, we bring our cities that don't know you, God. We, we bring them to the cross today, God. We ask that you would, Lord, you, you have forgiven their sin. But now, Lord, I ask that these people would come into a revelation that they are forgiven, that they are set free. And God, I pray that people would confess 
would believe in their heart and confess with their mouth today that you are Lord. I pray that our city would do that. I pray that I have family members I wish that would do that. Lord, help us to lead those people to confess with their mouth and believe in their heart today. Father, draw them to you so that all of those people can make that beautiful confession before you today. And Father, as we believe and confess, Father, you're, you're, you're willing, you're more than willing to set those captives free today. In Jesus' name, amen. times on Good Friday, there's a great emphasis on the cross, which it should be, but sometimes there's so little about the tomb, and the tomb is just as important because that's the setup for Sunday, come on somebody, that it's like the tomb, and this is what it says in John chapter 19, verse 38, later Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus, now Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. With Pilate's permission, he came, he took the body of the way. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. They, taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with the Jewish burial customs at the place where Jesus was crucified, I love this, there was a garden. Isn't it interesting? Started at a garden, and it ends at a garden. Something significant there to think about. There was a garden, 
and it was there was a garden, and in that garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. The tomb is a greenhouse. What's a greenhouse? It's where things grow. It's where things get preserved. It's where you put plants for a season until they grow. I figured it's like the tomb is a picture of a greenhouse. The Bible says, what did not Jesus say? Unless the seed goes into the ground and dies, it cannot produce many more seeds. It's a greenhouse. The body of Jesus was laid in accordance with the Sabbath. It was a place of rest. That, that it was like preparation. It's like Jesus was a seed that was planted into the ground and the tomb is the greenhouse that preserved it so that when the seed goes into the ground, the dirt does the work so that multiplication can come. Come on, so that's a picture of the resurrection right there. But it had to go. Jesus had to be laid into the tomb. And it's a, to me, it's a picture of this greenhouse. Jesus also fulfilled the Feast of Unleavened Bread because the Bible says God's firstborn would go to the grave without corruption. So Jesus fulfilled the Feast of Unleavened Bread by him being buried. But Jesus is the seed that, that died. It was the seed that was planted. And we see that on the third day, Jesus rose. And guess what? Those seeds from, from his death, his burial, his resurrection, those seeds are still producing fruit to this day. Jesus left a beautiful legacy behind, but yet the tomb is an important place because it's the place, it's the launching pad for the resurrection. It's the place where Jesus had to be laid for a season. It wasn't a, it wasn't a doom and gloom kind of a place. It wasn't, it wasn't the end of the story. It's actually the beginning of the story. And I love that it's interesting that 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 it started in a garden. Salvation way, way back in Genesis started in the garden. And then guess what? Jesus was laid in the garden. And he'd be raised to new life from a garden. I love that. A whole full circle thing is happening here. See, each of these places that we talked about today were also opportunities for us to give up, to give in, to give out, or lose hope. But on the other side of these places that we talked about today, the upper room, the garden, the courtyard, the cross, the tomb, on the other side of these things is breakthrough, healing, hope, and resurrection. Jesus told us as he was alive, he said these words, he, he or she who endures to the end will be saved. Jesus endured to the end. He went through the upper room. He went through the garden to the courtyard to the cross and to the tomb. He who endures to the end will be saved. Jesus gave a path and a model for us to follow. We also know that we have a blessed hope called the resurrection. And we're waiting for that on Sunday morning. We know what our blessed hope is. We know that Jesus already ascended. He already rose. But our blessed hope is that one day he is coming back. He is coming back. And one day we're going to be taken up to the air with him into glory, ushered into eternity forever. So, Father, we thank you today. We thank you that you took us on a little tour from, from the upper room to the garden, to the courtyard, to the cross, to the tomb. Father, thank you for showing us there's revelation and there's truth to be discovered at each of these places. And Father, as we reverently go to your tomb right now, we know that on this Good Friday, we know that you were a seed planted. And the seed had to go into the ground and die to produce more seeds. And Father, we thank you that to this day, those seeds of your death are still multiplying to this day. And Father, we are so thankful. We are so thankful that we have a blessed hope in a resurrected Christ. Not just in the past, not just in the present, but we believe in the future because you're coming back. And Father, no matter how bad life gets for us in the now, we have a blessed hope of the future. And Father, that gives us hope. That gives us great hope and great joy and great endurance to persevere. And Father, we thank you for the truth that says, as we endure to the end, we will be saved. Father, we need your strength. We need your endurance. And more importantly right now, we need your hope in these dark times. 
And we thank you, God, that there's no greater hope than the blessed hope. There's no greater hope than the promise of your return. There's no greater hope than the promise of being with you forever in eternity. There is no greater hope than that. No matter what we are facing here on earth, we can always look up. Like you said, when the time, don't look down, but look up for the time of our redemption is near. So, Father, we are so thankful that our soon coming redemption is near now than, than when we have ever seen before. And so, Father, we, we anchor our heart into that hope today. And, Father, we are so thankful that you turned the grave into a garden. We are so thankful that redemption started in the garden and it came full circle to a garden. We are so thankful that you rose from the dead from the garden. <laughs> We are so thankful for that today. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to close with this song, and as this song closes out, you we are free to go again. And we look forward to seeing uh, you guys on Easter Sunday. Take care, and Lord bless. Thank you.